interrupt this programming because of a local weather emergency. You are at the mercy of that wind. There's nothing you can do. I was so scared. I just get sucked up into the tornado. I'm going to get thrown into something and I'm done. We'll seek shelter on the lowest floor of the building. I had a, a second where I thought, do I let go or not? You wonder if, if you're going to make it. From the Weather Channel, this is Storm Stories with meteorologist Jim Cantore. September 24th, 2001, College Park, Maryland. It's only a couple of weeks after the 9-11 attacks on New York and the Pentagon. Life slowly returns to normal for the 34,000 students at the University of Maryland, 10 miles from Washington, D.C. Yeah, right. 51-year-old Pat Marlette okay. is the assistant director of Maryland Fire and Rescue Institute, a training facility on the university campus. He and his wife Patricia are the proud parents of three children. The oldest, Michael, is already out of the house. The younger sisters still live at home and attend the university. 23-year-old Colleen, a senior, and 20-year-old Aaron, a sophomore. I was fortunate enough to stay home and raise my children, so they had my values. They were just the best daughters a mother could want. They were sisters, but they were best friends as well. They really didn't do much that they didn't do together. It is amazing that Erin is even in school. Just eight months earlier, she underwent surgery for a brain tumor. Aaron's now nearly recovered and grateful to be alive. Aaron was just starting to return to her old self. She was studying sociology and she wanted to be a social worker. She was really very excited about doing what she could to help people. On this cool overcast Monday, Aaron and her sister stop by their father's office for a short visit. The skies have begun to look threatening. They just look like black clouds, like we would see uh, a thunderstorm. Pat, a Maryland native, has seen all kinds of weather over the years. We have hurricanes. We have what would be referred to as a nor'easters, which are heavy rainstorms that come from the coast. We will have snowstorms, blizzards, things like that. But this storm is different. Miles from the university, Supercell thunderstorms are creating currents of strong, rapidly rising air called updrafts. The updrafts are about to spawn violently swirling columns. While this kind of atmospheric instability is typical in the Midwest, it is less common in Maryland. In fact, the state has averaged just four tornadoes a year over the last five decades. We don't have tornadoes. Uh, it just doesn't, it doesn't happen here. In just a few minutes, that will change. While Pat visits with his daughters, his co-worker, 49-year-old British expatriate Ann Davidson, settles into her office. Her 12-year-old daughter Imogen is with her. I was at work for a normal day until I uh, took a 10-minute drive to the local Eleanor Roosevelt High School to pick up my daughter who wanted to work on my computer. I had a big school project due the next day for my French class. It was downloading too slow on my home computer, so I had to go to my mom's work. Anne looks out the window and sees the approaching storm. It was clear that we were having bad weather, um, what I would think of as a classic thunderstorm, although the difference was the sky looked very dark, um, a gray-green, and the winds were picking up. Just after 5.05 p.m., a tornado packing nearly 70 mile an hour winds moves into Washington, D.C., less than 10 miles from College Park. From her home in Clarksville, Patricia Marlette hears reports that the storm is racing northeast toward Interstate 95. Her thoughts turn to her husband and daughters on campus. 
I was talking to my mom on the phone. I said, maybe I should be a little more concerned about this. And my mom's remark was, you don't have to worry about a tornado in Maryland. At 5.10 p.m., a tornado warning is issued for the university area. National Weather Service Doppler radar indicated a tornado moving northeast at 35 miles an hour. But few in College Park are aware that serious trouble is coming. Twenty-five-year-old firefighter Philip Bird has heard reports of severe weather, but he's not concerned. I just remember blowing it off saying, you know, it's not going to come up this way, you know, and I just totally disregarded the warnings. 5.15 p.m., the tornado is now about five miles from College Park and growing stronger by the minute. At Maryland Fire and Rescue Institute, Pat Marlette is still visiting with Colleen and Aaron. The possibility of a twister never crosses his mind, but his offices are temporarily housed in a portable metal building. Pat's worried about lightning and urges his daughters to leave right away. I said to them, well, you guys better get on home before the storm hits. I had no idea that really the clouds that I was looking at uh, contained a, a tornado. The girls get in their car to leave as Pat walks back inside his office. A worried Ann Davidson is waiting for him. Things were starting to fly by the window. That made me think, well, perhaps we ought to get out of this flimsy building. But it's too late. In an instant, they are engulfed by the growling winds. You could hear debris starting to hit the side of the building. I could see some leaves and bigger clumps of I don't know what, flying past the window. When this was getting louder and louder, I realized, hey, this is something's going on here. A short distance away, Philip Bird is still in his truck. As he approaches the Fire and Rescue Institute, he drives straight into the tempest. A tornado warning for the he struggles to keep control in the swirling wind and rain. Lightning was just striking on either side of my vehicle. It was dark, nasty weather. I mean, like the worst thunderstorm I had ever driven in. Philip is unable to drive any further. All around him, vehicles are stopped. Drivers are watching in awe at what is taking place. I saw what everybody was staring at, and it was a funnel cloud forming. Seeing tree limbs and leaves and dust and dirt in the immediate area and start to just swirl up. Philip's heart leaps into his throat. I don't know if I was panicking, and I called my fiance to let her know that a tornado was chasing me up the road, and then I lost my signal on my cell phone. The wind whips at up to 200 miles per hour, tearing large trees and hurling cars through the air. I just covered my head and said, I, well, this is it. You know, my vehicle's going to get picked up, and I'm going to get, you know, thrown into something, and I'm done. It's now around 5.20 p.m. The fully formed tornado roars over the University of Maryland. Terrified college students run for shelter. Oh my God, Emily. Emily, it's okay. Inside the institute offices, Ann Davidson cries out in pain as her ears suddenly pop. This was a really significant, dramatic pressure change. Enough that I went, oh, you know, what was that? At that point, I yelled, everybody under the desks now. 12-year-old Imogen scrambles under her mother's desk. I couldn't see her, so I said, Imogen, are you under that desk? And she said, yes, and I said, good, stay there and hold on. The building begins to groan. Unable to reach her daughter, Anne throws herself on the floor of an adjacent office. I had a fleeting thought, I'm going to look really silly if this is just a Washington afternoon thunderstorm. But I hadn't even finished that thought when the power went out. Horrified, Pat Marlette pushes himself and a colleague onto the floor of the nearest meeting room. The windows in the back side of the building were, were blowing out. It, it was just a tremendous roar. Uh, it's just a noise that you'll just never forget. The tornado plows into the metal building, tearing apart the roof and the walls. There really wasn't time to be scared. Uh, I was in complete disbelief. Then the building started to go and there was uh, just an unbelievable noise. There was nothing that I could grab onto. Everything that I was trying to grab onto was moving. 
filing cabinets moving and flying and, you know, there was just metal banging, grinding. I was so scared and I thought that if the desk lifted away, I'd just get sucked up into the tornado. Your immediate thought is, am I going to make it? Am I going to get through this? College Park has never witnessed a severe tornado. Now the campus is in the grips of a devastating F3 twister that will shake this community to its core. That's next when Storm Stories returns. September 24, 2001. A powerful tornado tears through the University of Maryland in College Park. Across campus, panicked students run for cover. At the headquarters of the Maryland Fire and Rescue Institute, 51-year-old Pat Marlette is powerless as his office disintegrates. You are uh, at the mercy of that wind. I was just trying to protect myself, but there was no way I couldn't. The tornado slams through the walls, shredding metal and tossing debris into the air. You would catch a glimpse of what you thought was something that you recognized a wall, a door, or something, but um, none of it made any sense because it wasn't where I thought I was. Pat has spent more than 25 years overseeing rescue operations. Now, it is his life that lies in the balance. Your life flashes before you. You question whether or not you're going to get out alive. The force of the twister shoves him deep into a pile of deformed metal and broken furniture. I was trying to keep myself from being forced into this pile of debris, and I couldn't. Less than 15 feet away, 49-year-old Ann Davidson clutches onto the leg of a heavy desk. I realized that everything around me had gone, and I was simply enduring and hoping for the best. A few feet further, Ann's 12-year-old daughter Imogen huddles under another desk. I could feel the desk being dragged across the floor, and I was just kind of shuffling underneath it. I didn't think the desk or I could take much more of it. I remember, you know, one point thinking, how much worse can this get before it'll get better? For Anne, it is about to get much worse. Winds up to 200 miles per hour threaten to blow her into the funnel. She grasps for anything that will keep her grounded. In the nick of time, her left hand finds an edge of carpeting. As the winds pull her up, she dangles feet first into the twister. That was the only thing that kept me from blowing away, a seam in the carpet. Anne struggles to hold on as the immense power of the tornado tears the muscles in her shoulder. I had the sort of feeling of, was I gonna let go and go foot first into the tornado? And if this is it, well, it's been a darn good run. Then, just as quickly as it started, the twister moves on. Before I could make a decision or do anything, I was dropped back down again and the tornado had gone over me. A short distance away, firefighter Philip Bird huddles in his truck. His face and arms are a mass of cuts. He stares out at the University of Maryland campus. It just looked like a bombing occurred. You think about Oklahoma City, you think about the Pentagon, you think about the World Trade Center. Everything was just destroyed. Philip runs over to the remains of the Fire and Rescue Institute to look for survivors. I knew that there was people in that building. I just had an, you know, a real suspicion that there was people in there. In the rubble, Ann Davidson slowly comes to her senses. I was completely shocked. I was disorientated. I couldn't couldn't figure out for certain where I was. Then it dawned on me that the building had just been blown away. My immediate thought was, Imogen, where's Imogen? And I turned to look at where I thought she should have been. That moment was the worst moment of the whole experience. Anne discovers her daughter under a battered office desk and piles of rubble. Imogen is trapped, but appears uninjured. I could see some light coming in from a couple of little spots where there was no debris. And I just had to say to her, you know, are you all right? Can you hang on? You're going to have to just stay calm. Nearly 25 miles away in Clarksville, Pat Marlett's wife Patricia is sick with worry. It's nearly 6 p.m. and she's heard several reports that a tornado hit the university campus. 
Now, she can't reach her husband Pat or her college-age daughters Colleen and Aaron, who were on their way home from their father's office when the twister struck. I didn't hear anything. The traffic was a horrendous state of confusion in that immediate area, so I just waited. I waited here, waited patiently. In the rubble of his office, Pat Marlette is seriously injured. Ann Davidson finds him buried beneath several feet of debris. But his only concern is for his two daughters. He said, I'm okay. He didn't give any details. Um, but he said, what about my girls? I asked her if she saw the girls. I knew the girls were in the parking lot. I said, check the parking lot. I said, check the cars. Ann wades through the debris to check for his daughters. Every car that had been in the parking lot was in the parking lot. And so I said, well, they must have made it clear. I said a little prayer of thanksgiving that they had made it. Within minutes, rescue workers descend upon the chaotic campus. That's only a pickup truck. I've, I myself, I've counted at least... <laughs> Dozens of firefighters flock to the rubble of Maryland Fire and Rescue. It was Less than 10 minutes later, Anne helps pull her daughter Imogen out from under the rubble. But we got her out, and you know, obviously I gave her a big hug and said, I'm so terribly proud of you. But Pat Marlette is still buried and bleeding profusely. Pat Marlette is trapped under that pile with apparently a head injury. Finally, after nearly an hour, the rescue team pulls Pat from the rubble and rushes him to the hospital. It's now early evening. Everyone inside the Fire and Rescue Institute building has made it out alive. I was uh, relieved, almost elated. I had just assumed that everybody was safe and it's what it appeared to be. Um, it, it somehow didn't, didn't seem possible that it could have been otherwise. But not everyone has been accounted for. Colleen and Aaron Marlette are still missing. It's early evening, September 24th, 2001. Nearly two hours after a tornado shattered the University of Maryland campus. Pat Marlette is recovering at the hospital. He's still waiting for word about his college-aged daughters, Colleen and Aaron, who left his office just moments before the twister struck. Then, he hears that there have been two fatalities on campus. Picked up by the wind. There were two students in a car that were killed. I don't know why I knew, but I knew then that it was Colleen and Aaron. Rescuers have found the girl's car. It had been picked up by the tornado and thrown more than a quarter of a mile over a high-rise dormitory. Pat's wife, Patricia, is waiting at their home in Clarksville when she receives the devastating news. I had the feeling, and I, I was positive that Colleen was here, and she just said, Mom, it's just so beautiful here. It's just so beautiful. So I really knew before anybody told me. We are just glad that they're together. They, they live their lives together. You expect to lose your parents, but you don't ever expect to lose your children. It's a parent's worst nightmare. Twice. Think about the worst thing in the world that can happen to you, and then have it happen twice. In all, more than two dozen people on the University of Maryland campus suffered injuries in the freak tornado. Damages at the school alone approached $10 million. But the loss of the Marlette girls is the toughest for the community to take. And that was utterly the worst moment of the tornado. Everything else could be rebuilt, um, put back together again, we'd be all right. But there's simply no changing the loss of Aaron and Colleen. Since that time, the Marlettes have tried to make peace with Colleen and Aaron's deaths. Within days after the tornado, they set up a scholarship in their daughter's honor. One of your greatest fears is that your loved ones will be forgotten. 
who should we be angry with? The wind? We can't be angry with the wind. It just seems to me to be an act of God. We're very, very blessed that we have the faith that we have. Because that's all you have. There's nothing else. Many people think that tornadoes only strike in rural areas, that they're not a danger for cities like College Park. But that's not always the case. We'll tell you why when Storm Stories returns. So do tornadoes normally strike metropolitan areas like College Park? Though we usually associate twisters with rural areas, they can and do strike large cities. In fact, parts of Oklahoma City have been hit more than 50 times since 1890. Still, more than 95% of the United States is rural, so chances are a twister will occur in less populated areas. For Storm Stories, I'm meteorologist Jim Cantori. Your local forecast is next.